Um, but it is a pleasure to welcome so many of you here to talk about a really important topic. I want to give you just a little bit of background on dialogue before I turn it over to my friend Mike Thompson, who's going to introduce tonight's panel. Um, but dialogue is something that we started in the Glenn College three or four years ago uh, based upon a desire to have informed, objective, and civil conversations. Uh, and so we didn't name it debate, we named it dialogue. Uh, we pick a timely, uh, newsworthy, and sometimes contentious topic, uh, and we invite some smart and informed people to offer their perspective on the topic, but ultimately, the hope is that you all join this conversation. Uh, so as Mike's going to explain, there are microphones here, and we, we encourage you very much to be a part of this, this dialogue. The only thing we ask is that you be civil. Um, and so when, when you come forward with a question, uh, we want you to be engaged and, and, and lively and passionate, uh, but, but we hope that you do it in a way that is respectful of the various perspectives that are here. Um, if you violate that norm, we will replace you with a robot. Um, so um, there are many waiting out there to take all of our jobs, including you as participants. Um, for those of you who have come tonight hoping to see Kai Rizdal, um, we are sorry to say that he uh, fell ill. Um, yesterday we learned uh, very quickly in the day, early in the day, that he could not be with us tonight. Um, but fortunately, and it really is uh, tremendously generous of our, um, another member of his organization, David Brancaccio, to step in for <laughs> So with that, I am going to turn it over to Mike Thompson from WOSU, who's going to take us through the protocol for this evening and introduce our guests. Thanks. My name is Mike Thompson. I'm News Content Director for WOSU Public Media. And we at WOSU are just so thrilled to be a part of this dialogue series because this is what we do. We bring people together, whether it's on the radio, on TV, through our digital channels like our website or our social media channels. Or, in person, we bring people together, we want to learn new things, we want to hear different perspectives, and that's what we're trying to do here with Dialogue. The topic tonight is crucial to our country, our community, and our families. How the heck are we going to make a living? How are our kids going to make a living? How are our grandkids going to make a living in this rapidly changing economy? This is not new. A couple of weeks ago, I went out to western Pennsylvania with my wife for a weekend getaway, and I went to this old grist mill, which is now a souvenir shop, general store type thing. And inside, I was looking at all the mechanisms, how this all worked. This thing is 200 years old, 200 years old. And there's a plaque in there that says the owner of this grist mill designed it so it could be operated by one guy. <laughs> one guy. So automation was stealing jobs 200 years ago. But it probably produced some cheaper grain for the local baker. So there you go. So that's what we're going to talk about here tonight. As Trevor said, this is a dialogue. We want you to be a part of the discussion. Our panel will lay the groundwork for about 10 or 15 minutes, get your mind thinking, and then you go up to the microphones here on either side. Just you know, line up behind them, and we'll get to as many comments and questions as we can. To make sure we get to as many as we can, we ask you to keep your question or your comments brief, brief questions or comments. This is dialogue, not monologue. So keep that in mind. All right, to our panel. Uh, Lisa Pat McDaniel is with us. She, is, she leads the Workforce Development Board of Central Ohio. Their mission is to match employers, local businesses, with local employees so they both thrive in this new economy. That's what they try to do. Also, uh, Scott McLemore is with Honda of America. His job is to attract and deploy talented employees in this new economy, and manufacturing, of course, is rapidly changing. And our host, David Brancaccio, you listen to him every morning on 89.7 NPR News as the host of the Marketplace Morning Report. He was the host of Marketplace's Evening Report for 10 years. He left to work with Bill Moyers at PBS on a program called Now, and then he went to do a documentary, produced a documentary called Fixing the Future, which is about this new economy. So... David, go ahead and fix our future. Thank you very much. <laughs> thank you. Let me just start by saying thank you. Thank you. Uh, here's why. Uh, the aforementioned Bill Moyers calls me up one night a couple years ago. I didn't even recognize him. He had no voice at all. He had a fever. 
he said, look, you got to do me a favor. 92nd Street Y, which is the big venue like this in New York City, he had to interview Paul Krugman, the Nobel Prize economist and uh, columnist, that night. He had no voice. So could you go over and do, yeah, sure, of course, Bill. So I go over there just like this with Kai. And they go, unfortunately, Mr. Moyers is ill. And everybody goes, boo, I want my money back. This stings. And I'm sitting in the wings. So thank you for, no, they, they perked up when they said my name. Um, Kai is one of those people who shows up. He would have walked over coals to be here. It's just he has no voice. And he, you don't want him breathing on you right now. He'll be fine in a couple of days. He's very, very sorry he could not be here. And I'm very happy to be here. Well, panelists, thank you for doing this. Thank you. This is uh, Amazon Alexa. Here we have <laughs> Apple Siri. I am the HAL 9000 of uh, <laughs> soon. That will be the pa That's how we should have replaced. <laughs> The really original is. host of this is to, to do automation. Done. Let me start by asking a question of each of our panelists in turn. You know, we're talking about the jobs of the future and how we get the skills to train them, but how do we know what the jobs of the future are? Lisa? Well, I wish I knew the answer to that because my job would be so much easier. But I think that we don't know necessarily all the jobs that are coming at us, just like uh, you know, 10 years ago, I wouldn't have known that I couldn't run my life without my smartphone. And so I think what we have to concentrate on, I think the question is, what skills do people have to have regardless of the jobs that come along? And I think there's some key things. I think all employers want employees who can critically think, who can communicate well, who can be collaborative, um, I'm looking at you to make sure you do feel that way as an employer, Scott. Uh, <laughs> who can, um, you know, be creative. And if we teach people, and who can continu continuously learn. And if people have those skills and are fluent in those skills, I think it doesn't matter what jobs come along, we'll be able to adapt. Are so. you trying to figure out a way to come at that question in an organized way to figure out, well, all right, so what are some of the additional skills that we have to start training for? Actually, yes. The Workforce Development Board uh, is working with some funding partners. And over the next 12 months, we'll be taking a look at uh, what, what kind of jobs do we expect, especially here in Central Ohio, and what skills, in addition to the ones that I've discussed, will need to be added. How do we go about making sure not only that children are getting those skills through school, but also what do we do about adults, especially those adults who are already being left behind in our current economy here in Central Ohio? How do we get them to get those skills to fill the jobs that are coming online now, that we don't have the time to wait for the five-year-old? in kindergarten, who actually could take your iPad, do 20 million things on it that <laughs> I still don't get, right? And so we're going to be looking at that over the next 12 months through a task force with recommendations, and not just recommendations, but then actually how do we implement this? So. Let me ask you the same question, Scott, at Honda. Yeah. I mean, I know the jobs you need today. Yeah. I looked them up online before I came here, and I'll be applying later. Um, in this era of full employment, maybe you would even give me a job. Um, but the jobs of the future, I mean, you have to be worried about that you'll have those skills, but how do you figure those out? Yeah, it's, it's a, a difficult question to answer. And, and like Lisa said, uh, we, um, our focus is really on the skills that are required. Um, as new technology comes out from both a product standpoint um, and an equipment standpoint, internally our engineers and designers are feeding that information um, into our tra technical training centers. They're sharing it with our recruiting, our recruiting teams. Um, and we're trying to work to identify those foundational skills that are required for young people uh, to begin with. Because at, what we're finding is if we don't push those skills down further and further into elementary school, decisions that are made about career paths that are taken are impacted by that. And if we, if we can't have, the, if we can't have a, a, a broader spectrum of people with those skills at an early age, 
from a talent perspective, we find many challenges in terms of filling those positions that we have today as well as those that um, we're going to need for tomorrow. A lot of what I notice is trending um, in terms of technology and where we're headed with that. And then in turn, what we'll do is we'll speak to our educational partners about, you know what, you might want to consider um, integrating not just mechanical and pneumatic learning in terms of uh, mechanisms and, 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 uh, and, and how mechanical things work, but with networking as well. So we have the need for talent that can work across that spectrum. So um, I think it's more about the skills and then collaborating around what those skills look like in the future. So interesting. You've talked about uh, pushing some of these needs down into the consciousness of younger students. I remember talking as part of a project that we did about the changes that technology is um, is bringing to the workforce. Uh, talked with, uh, to a public school teacher who said, we are training children in elementary school now for jobs that do not exist now. Right. So what right. do we do? So what's the answer? Instead of having fourth graders talk about, I want to be a doctor, lawyer, or radio announcer, yeah. you want them saying something in the STEM field? Or what, what, what are the some of the answers you'd like to hear? Well, I, I, what, I, yeah, what I'd like to hear is, uh, where they have exposure directly to um, hands-on learning. So um, it's a combination of theoretical learning with actual application. And the more exposure I think they get to actually doing things and connecting the dots between what they're learning from a theoretical standpoint to actually making something work or fixing something or creating something, designing something, and then turning that into something that exists, whether it's a program, whether it's something physical, I think we need to hear much more of that happening. So, you know, school kids, but Lisa, you must be working with educational institutions at all levels because, yes. I mean, we've done this story many times over, this idea of institutions of higher learning graduating people without the skills that might be the most sought after. So you're, these are ongoing dialogues you're having? Yes, they are. And actually, uh, when Scott was just talking about what he'd like to see, we had a summer program this past summer with the PAST Foundation. And they're, they're an organization here, uh, right, not very far from here, actually. And uh, we had some of our students, uh, they're actually all were in foster care. And so they were from you know, a variety of uh, backgrounds and barriers, right? And um, they were in a program where they got to create, apply, learn theory, create, and apply that theory immediately from music creation, 3D printing, robots. Um, and I thought, gosh, this, this is the kind of thing that we do need to have, all, that all kids need to get exposed to. Because I don't know that, I mean, we can talk to a four-year institution like Ohio State, and I myself am a graduate student of Ohio State, graduated from here. Um, but if you, they can't fix what hasn't been addressed in high school, in junior high, middle school, in elementary school. And so we have to, we have to be addressing it at all levels. And it has to be, um, it ha those institutions need to be talking to each other. And that is happening more. Um, our community college is, is a big player in this as well, reaching back into those institutions be below them to help uh, develop curriculum and help create uh, the kind of learning so that the, by the time they get to them, to the community college or an institution like this, that foundation's already built. Can I ask if college is always required for these jobs of the future? They are not. No? Let's talk <laughs> but, about that. Lisa, why don't you talk about that, really? <laughs> no, no, we they are not. We used to call it vocational, but that's, uh, that's a kind of an old term. Well, and it has a, uh, it has a perception yeah. uh, that isn't accurate. Exactly. And probably wasn't completely accurate then either. Um, no, right now uh, we have an organization in town who is take, they're taking people who do not have college degrees uh, in a 15-week boot camp in the IT space and putting them at the end into jobs that are paying sixty to ninety thousand um, dollars. There are I, I met a kid 
uh, last spring. He was coming out of the career technical education uh, in the Southwestern City School District, which you don't know where that is, but it's <laughs> south of Columbus. Um, he sat there and he said to me, he was in welding, he would be graduating. And across the way, there was an ambulance company. They build ambulances. And he said to me, I will have a job with that company as soon as I graduate with my welding certificate. I will be driving a F-150 Ford truck. I will have a house. And I will be going to my friend's college graduation with money. And, <laughs> and they will be looking for. And no debt. For, right, and no debt. And I will be looking for a job. And I said, dude, you have it figured out. Yeah. Your parents or whoever supported you had the wisdom to find out what it was you were interested in and to support that and not automatically push you to college because not every job right. requires that college yeah. education. And I think that there are other jobs that employers ask for a college education where if we really sat and thought about it, there are uh, credentials less than a four-year degree that would get them employees with the right skills. Doesn't mean that employee can eventually build on that and get a four-year right. degree, right. but that they don't need it to do the job they have. Scott, now. what are your thoughts on that, about this idea of it's inexorable, that people got to think about community college or college to get the jobs of the future? Yeah, it's, it's preventing us from the, finding the talent. As an industry, it's preventing us from the, finding the talent that we need. Um, at Honda, we spend a lot of time educating, promoting pathways um, that um, are not necessarily directly into a four-year university uh, with a four-year degree. Um, there's a lot of discussion with uh, on and off ramps from a career pathway. I like to believe that they're on and on ramps, maybe not off, but uh, there are multiple ways in which one can get the skills the credential, the degree that's required for the role, and then move on into something else if they decide that you know, they want to continue to learn, which I think is very important. So what we found to be successful in the models that we've developed um, at Honda with our educational partners here uh, regionally is to articulate exactly what Lisa said, because we have opportunities like that. Um, what's interesting, though, is what we're finding is parents of students, if we're talking to high school students, want to hear that it doesn't stop there. So, okay, um, a student can, in this case, move from a career tech uh, education into a Columbus State Community College or a Community College Technical Program. Um, we can provide work opportunities for them while they're in college. Uh, we can then hire them and then offer tuition reimbursement if they want to go on for a four-year degree from a local university, which is a model that we've created. So our challenge is that the messaging for that is not out there, and career pathways are not well understood. Well, there and may be a stigma. There is a stigma. Yeah. And, and I think collaboration around um, that messaging is important, uh, because what we're also finding is it's not, uh, the message isn't um, received well when just the Career Tech Center goes out and talks about it, or just when the community college goes out. It's a collaborative effort when, when Honda, Career Tech, community college, whatever the educational institution is, shows up collectively and explains the, the pathway, that's when things seem to click. Well, that's the key to the pathway, right? Because it's not unreasonable for the parents to push back a bit on this because you don't want the child to get this great job at age 17 and a half doing computer-assisted design um, using 2018 technology. And then when that becomes obsolete, yeah. not having the uh, academic background right. to be able to, to uh, shift into yeah. the next big thing. And yeah. this isn't what you're talking about. You're talking about essentially in-service training and, 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 and tuition and so forth. Yes, I, I, and I think um, as we go forward, and, and Lisa was on a panel in which I learned a lot about this recently, is in the future, um, we're really going to have to focus on continuous learning. That's mm -hmm. going to be the key um, for everyone to be successful in uh, the age of automation and, and AI. Mm -hmm. And um, men, industry is going to have to support that. Um, and, and I think we're going to have to collaborate again to, to make that successful. And if I can just, industry has to support that. 
employers need to, employers cannot just sit and hope to receive talent. And I think they know that. And Honda certainly is a leader in this region. You don't want them sitting around saying, we're not getting the people we need. Right, And not right. actually working to change that. Is what right, absolutely. And uh, I think that, aha, sorry. Mm -hmm. I think that um, the idea of employers providing work opportunities, why kids are in school, mm -hmm. even as far back as high school, yeah. I would argue, to yeah. expose them. And then knowing, I mean, one of the great things that's happening here um, is our good friends at Nationwide. Uh, they have uh, a group of people in IT. Uh, the system they are working on is going away. And Nationwide took the step to create a training program for their own employees that will allow them to move to other parts of the company. And Nationwide's a huge company. Yeah. And that kind of forethought, because they needed people in those jobs, and why not train people who are in jobs that are going away, which is part of what, right, we're concerned about. Mm -hmm. It's the employer who is doing that. And so um, we need employers to think that way, that they need to take as much responsibility for their own talent as I take right. in my everyday work. Okay, so if this event is going to be successful, we're going to make it interactive, and we're not going to put a couple of pro forma questions at the end. So with a group this big, think about the IQ that's right here. Please formulate your question. I'm just going to ask one more question on the panel, but then I'm going to throw it to you for what you're interested in. So my question before we get to more interactive cross-examination is um, we've been talking about younger people. Is there no hope for someone who's now 25 or someone who's now 35, we can keep going up the decades, to get a job of the future? Do we do enough to, uh, to reorient adults and reskill them? I'll start with Scott. What's your feeling about older uh, workers? I, I think it's a, a great opportunity for us to engage. Um, and quite honestly, in the program that we've established uh, with Columbus State uh, for our technician, our technician pathway, we found a lot of success with those students that are non-traditional, um, maybe have worked for a bit, um, then went back to school, and are looking for something different, um, some upward mobility, a career. Um, so, you know, we're very interested in identifying those people and providing those opportunities. And, and Honda, too, like Lisa mentioned, Nationwide Honda also has um, a very robust incumbent training uh, program where we offer opportunities for production associates to skill up uh, there on site and uh, become qualified for some of these higher technical positions. Well, let's visualize that, right? Because you might have a job that is endangered by the robot that's going to come online in six months. And if you could take the person whose job is endangered by the, the robot that does the repetitive work and help her get new skills, they could be fixing the robot. Yeah, and it, it's a sustainability issue for us, uh, meaning um, as that technology changes within our operations, we have to have uh, production associates that are qualified, confident, and ready that they can operate that equipment and to some extent um, identify when it's not working properly. So um, we're less concerned about them being replaced and more concerned about their ability to operate that equipment um, safely and so that we're producing a quality product. Any thoughts about um, is there hope for people who are grown-ups in uh, reorienting themselves? Well, I spent a lot of my time with the grown-ups. Uh, there is hope. The issue is if you have an adult who's working a job 40 hours, or if they are underemployed and they're working more than one, mm -hmm. and let's say they have a family, uh, how do we, my question is, if they want to go into a different job and a different career pathway, how do we get them skilled up in the time that we have with them? How do, and how do they, if they want to step away to skill up, I talked about that uh, IT program, right, where it's a 15-week program. That is a 40-plus-hour-a-week program. 
how do we help them cover expenses? How do we help them maintain housing? How do we help them maintain their family? That, there is hope if we can solve that problem. And that is something that we are putting a lot of effort into trying to be creative. Certainly workplace training, like Honda is doing, providing those opportunities for lower skilled or workers who are at the entry levels to skill up and move up um, is a great way to do it. But for those who want to get into Honda and they're doing uh, home health care, yeah. how, how do we do that? Uh, right. and, and as technology changes quickly and people maybe are not staying in this, we talk about career pathways, but people may want to change career pathways. Yeah. How, how do we get to them? How do we do that? And I think that's where adult education and the support for adult education within our career technical centers and, and other educational institutions is very, very important. And we have to continue to focus on how to make that accessible, um, whether it's um, timing, you know, how much time is Could required. Child care? Yeah, yes, child right. Care. Transportation. 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 Yeah, absolutely. So, and again, this is where I think collaboration is the key. Uh, mm -hmm. So you have to have educators, industry, economic development coming together and having these discussions and, and coming up with solutions. Because I'm a very brave person, I uh, took a deep dive into this thick document that the McKinsey Global Institute generated not too long ago. And it looked at every career in America as they could figure it out. And they looked at which are the ones most vul are most vulnerable to artificial intelligence, to automation, to robots encroaching. And um, you may be interested in looking it up. It's, uh, the, the, I gave you enough keywords for you to look it up. Anybody here, raise your hand, think you do a job that robots can't do any portion of? Shout out one. What is it, body piercer? <laughs> you're right, you're right. There's no way I want the robot. Well, it's interesting. I have a very protected one, uh, radio anchor man. Siri, tell me the Dow Jones Industrial Average. The Dow went up 12. I mean, a little piece of my job is definitely automated. Most of our jobs have a piece. What McKinsey looked at is how much. Um, Occupational therapist is a pretty good job to have into the future, even if there's a flat screen that you could help people get new abilities. You still, empathy is the real thing, and listening really carefully is the thing that an OT person does. Um, you know what's really protected? You'll never believe this. Tree pruner. <laughs> it's an outside job, and all the trees are different. It's not that easy for automation mm -hmm. to do that kind of stuff. But all of us have bits of it. And at the point in your job that you do something over and over, something repetitive, there's going to be a bright person who got the right skills who's trying to invent something, a piece of technology, that can do that more efficiently. Um, now that we've lubricated up the notion of, um, of getting you involved, look at those nice microphones. You have a question about the jobs of the future? in the face of technology? Tell us your name, sir. Yeah, hi, I'm uh, Jerry Hudson. I'm, uh, I'm at the Mershon Center here at Ohio State. And uh, you've rightly emphasized the acquisition of technical skills. That's, they're obviously crucial uh, for the future of work. But uh, my question deals with the skill that you haven't mentioned yet, which is the acquisition of a foreign language and how knowing one or two or even three foreign languages uh, might help face challenges that are facing the workforce in the future. Is that on your radar? Um, uh, I would think at Honda that you would value people oh, who... Absolutely. It's not a requirement necessarily, but it offers up some learning agility that uh, you know, we could leverage in, in many different ways quite honestly. Um, so, yeah, I, I think at Honda, it, there's, you know, well, I think my career is an example. You, you can start in one place, uh, from my, you know, my example, engineering, um, developing some skills. I, I had some language skills, um, which allowed me to um, work with our uh, different uh, 
plants, but I can, you can move within the company. And I think the learning agility is maybe the key from what my takeaway from what you're saying is, uh, again, that continuous learning and ability to connect concepts um, with um, skills and application. Well, I also think uh, having tried to use one of those trans Google translation and uh, trying to translate into French, which actually was a language at one time I was fluent in and am not anymore, so please don't come up to me and speak French after this to test me out, uh, and had to run it by somebody who was currently fluent and knowing that what I had translated wasn't exactly correct. And I think there's a... Um, language, there is perception, body language, that's actually different too, uh, related to different. I'm, Itali I'm Italian, can you tell? Use my hands. I'm using my hands more than you are. Because so <laughs> I'm purposely I'm trying not to. I know. I've um, and, and I think, uh, I don't, so from the point of Will uh, speaking, not having to learn a language because you can have it translated uh, by Alexa or Siri or Google, I, I think maybe for uh, something quick, sure, but not for true communication. Yeah. And right. uh, in business, you need true communication yeah. with real people yeah. and understanding how we their still, language operates. Yeah, we actually still use a lot of Japanese terms. Uh, and, and I was working with one of my recruiters today and had to explain <laughs> what, what this particular thing meant. So The yeah, question also uh, brings to mind my advice to uh, high school students when they ask me what the secret to success is. I said there are three. Show up on time, shower occasionally, and learn Mandarin. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> on this side of the room, tell us your name, sir. Yeah. Um, is this on now? Is it on? Okay. Yeah. Uh, my name is Jonathan Jervich. I'm an elementary school teacher. And there's a huge push within our field to um, educate our students about social emotional skills oftentimes referred to as soft skills, mm -hmm. which are actually critical skills, so let's just get rid of soft skills, right? <laughs> um, but empathy, respect, awareness of other people. And um, even though this is our push at the elementary level, as we're talking about adult education, I kind of want to push you about, we're in a time where I feel like that is also something that should be a part of adult education as we're moving forward. And I'd kind of like your thoughts on that, um, about bringing character education back into adult learning. Well, uh, as somebody who employs people, I will take somebody who has critical, I'm going to use that, I'll stop saying soft skills, yeah, critical, critical skills you. over, uh, over um, deep knowledge. If somebody has deep knowledge and not critical skills, because I feel I can teach them the deep knowledge, we can find that out. But the ability to interact with other human beings in a way that makes you effective is much more important to me. Um, we get that from employers all the time, those critical skills and the three that, uh, that um, David mentioned. And um, there's constant complaints about the ability of people to communicate, to be respectful. Um, and that's just, you know, character education, you know, I feel like that was my husband and my job with our daughters. And I understand that not everybody gets that, and it's very hard in adults to make that something that's understandable. Why, you know, my supervisor dissed me and I shouldn't have to take, he disrespected me. Well, let's talk about how that played out and what your part in, that's just very hard, but it's very important because we can't, you know, some people were trying to help them get jobs, just haven't been in that environment. And it takes a while, you can't undo in a two-week course, what it took 30 or 40 years to build. Scott, you ever have to do any uh, remedial work with some of your hires to like teach them how to work better in teams yeah, or anything? I mean, yeah, I, I, I don't know if it's remedial work, but I, I, I'll say that uh, I, I agree completely, by the way, and, and critical skills, uh, we'll, we'll take uh, those folks all day long. Um, onboarding, um, I think, is important in that aspect. Mentorship um, would be helpful for that. Um, I think at Honda or, or any organization, um, the acclimation to the culture is important. Um, so that's not, it may not be exactly what you're talking about in terms of, of developing those skills, but I think it's supporting one that can bring those skills 
um, to function within a particular organization, I, I think the mentorship piece is very important. Um, and uh, especially as we have new hires into the organization, and especially in our work-based learning environment, um, working with those students um, or new hires, depending on, on what the situation is, to um, let them know that they're part of a team and um, while at the same time uh, trying to bring out their individual characteristics and thinking. That's very important to us from an individual standpoint uh, for us to be successful in the future. Sir, your name? Yeah, Brad Henry. So, uh, hey Scott. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so I work on the uh, software side, and currently we're in the process of integrating blockchain with biometric data, with AI, deep learning, and AI, uh, and AR with wearable tech to deliver and mitigate these types of training processes to allow people to learn while actually doing, as opposed to having people sitting in class and constantly just, just being hammered you know, by a professor. Sorry about that. <laughs> Being respectful. So, but yeah, the, the whole idea is, is to get people to learn while doing, but then to also be able to provide the opportunity to be able to track that information when they need opportunities for retraining so that we can effectively push the data to the user so that we're actually working with the individuals. How do you see that changing within the context of Honda and other institutions throughout the state? Yeah. Um, yeah, so we're, we're exploring that. Um, very interested in that in our technical development centers and, and leveraging that uh, technology to support um, more elevated uh, training. Um, I think my interest, one of my interests in that area is taking that type of technology and bringing it to a broader uh, group, right? So working with um, our educational partners and providing that type of learning um, where assets, physical assets and things like that uh, are hard to come by, are harder to come by from a financial standpoint. Um, I think that's the learning of the future for sure. Uh, and we really need, again, it's collaboration, right? And it, first of it, first of all, I think it, it needs, there's an understanding that has to happen within our organization about what that technology is and how we would use it, um, how we would leverage it uh, to get some buy-in and some support around um, implementation, maybe as a pilot, but then then expanding that um, across our training centers, but also with our educational partners as well. So technology and, turbocharging training, that's a really that interesting is area. That is very interesting. Um, I think uh, in, in what I've read, what little I know, and what you just said is way beyond me, but I think I understand what you're talking about, uh, is that human beings have to get used to that kind of training, right? There, uh, there has to be some adaptation by the person who is going to be involved at that kind of training because yeah. it's so, um, it's it's next to your skin, literally next to your skin. Um, that I think, I think for our younger children uh, with virtual reality, that is going to be somewhat uh, comfortable for them, but for Older people, I, I think there's going to, they may not be as comfortable right off, and there'll have to be some adaptation to yeah, it. Yeah, but I think it allows us some integration of learning that doesn't exist today, right? Yeah. Yeah, so. Correct, yeah, because we actually address the older worker along with the millennial. Yeah. So it's providing those mechanisms that support each each uh, section right. within those, uh, those, those type of learners. Right. We reported on a story connected to this where the Navy had a problem. When ships are at sea and they used to get the old Windows 95 blue screen of death, you need a lot of sailors who can do be network troubleshooters. And they figured out with a Silicon Valley company a, um, a mentorship through interacting with a screen system that got people in four or five months up to the skill level of someone who'd done it for a couple of years. And it sounds like you're pursuing quantum leaps, uh, including like physical training? Yeah, yeah, because I'm definitely the older guy. I turned 50 this year, but I also work with a lot of millennials, so uh, I'm, I'm very familiar with uh, the, uh, the dynamics between the old and uh, the young. Yeah. It's well, a huge paradigm shift. And for kinetic learners, right, that ability to do, be trained while doing as opposed to right. sitting, right. Uh, that could be leaps and bounds in their ability to learn something much quicker. Well, it, it provides some flexibility for the trainer as well in terms of developing scenarios and, and things like that that you might be limited within a physical 
component world. Well, keep at it. In the William Gibson novel Neuromancer that many people know, they just insert the little chip into your head and you have the skill. <laughs> and do you remember what he called it? Microsoft. <laughs> he did. It's, it's unbelievable. Uh, tell us your name. Uh, Beverly Lopper. I'm director of the Ohio Department of Aging, and I'm really excited to hear you talk about older workers. However, um, 50, I don't consider um, an older worker. I, <laughs> the, um, I'm almost 57, and I'm gainfully employed. Um, I, uh, as we're working hard to help people age more healthfully, um, more and more people are working longer. So I encourage you to think 60s, 70s. People are not retiring. I don't intend to retire until I, you know, really have to, I'm you know, healthy, um, can still contribute. But there's another side to that coin. As our population in Ohio, age 60 and over, gro is growing 20 times faster than the general population, we have a number of older people who aren't as healthy as some of us, and um, we aren't going to have the care. We already are seeing a gap in the a sufficient pool of caregivers for people who are living with dementia, people who have chronic illnesses. And we are exploring technology options um, for complementing hands-on care, hands-on care, but, but it can't replace a person who is needing to care for a person with dementia. So um, I'm just interested in your thoughts about that, um, both how do we uh, make use of the talent of people who are healthy as they're aging, um, as well as how are we going to fill the gaps for people who well, actually, care. your company, Honda, has pioneered some uh, electronic caregivers in Japan. Yeah, we're, that's um, you know, a part of uh, um, our robotics and what we're working on in terms of uh, providing services to, to, to people like that um, and exploring that and making you know, people's lives easier. Um, and, and, and better and safer. So there, there's that piece. Um, yeah, that, that's an interesting thought. I, I guess my an answer I would give is uh, from an industry standpoint, um, again, encouraging um, learning opportunity, encouraging and offering learning opportunities um, to those older workers um, uh, to keep them um, uh, interested in working at the company. and. Um, uh, offering an opportunity for them to bring value, right, in their in their jobs every day. So, um, in <laughs> we have to do a better job as a, as an industry uh, as a whole, as in terms of offering these learning opportunities. So I, that's not an easy thing to do. Um, it requires investment and things like that. But I think it, it's worth it if someone wants to continue working in your operations and, and is able to continue to bring value. And certainly a job of the future is uh, working in those caregiving yeah. fields, given the demographics. Uh, tell us your name, please. Hi, uh, my name is Nate Schumacher. Is, he, is it on? Okay. Yeah. I'm a third year public affairs and economics major here at Ohio State. Um, I was wondering what the role for government is in adult education going forward. So we've talked a lot about the employers educating and maintaining their employees. Is there a role for government to incentivize employers to keep employees going longer and training them for new jobs, or is it solely on the employers and the market's responsibility to train people and keep people up to date? So Lisa, local, regional, and state, because I don't even know if we want to mention federal because it's so controversial, <laughs> but we will get there. But what are your early reactions? Well, actually, our, our primary funding is actually comes through the federal government, and that is what we do at the Workforce Development Board through our job center is we help uh, uh, job seekers acquire skills so that they can get jobs with Honda. But it, I, I guess it has to be a two-way street, right? We have to understand what skills they need, and then we have to help uh, make sure that there are providers that provide good training so that when we send somebody there, they're truly getting what they need and they can truly show up at Honda with the right base of skills. Um, I. You know, every day, that's my job, trying to convince locally and state that we need to make investments uh, as government. I'm a nonprofit, actually, but, but as government 
in the training of the residents of the state of Ohio, of the central Ohio region. And uh, because, because many of our, here in Franklin County, a third of our population is living at less, at 200% of poverty or less. And that is a huge amount of human capital that if given the right opportunity, could be gaining the skills to get all the jobs that all of my employers are saying, we don't have people, we don't have people, which I completely understand. And if they're living at 200% of poverty, I can't really rely just on employers to train them. You're right about that. And so where do we get the capital for that? I think we get it from a variety of sources. I believe that government is one of those sources. But I also believe that um, there are other sources um, in our foundations, uh, in the ways that uh, we bring, uh, we actually have opportunities through programs to make money and give us discretionary funds that allow us to train um, in areas where perhaps there isn't currently funding. So I think it's a shared responsibility. I absolutely don't think it's just the employers, but I do believe employers have to step up as well. Role for government? Uh, I, again, I think it's collaborative. We um, partner here um, in, throughout the state um, uh, in manufacturing sector partnerships. So it's an industry-led coalition, including education and government. And we do this through the Ohio Manufacturers Association, which then can speak on behalf of manufacturing and help with policy and legislation. Um, and, and many times bring those um, policymakers into our conversation so they can hear firsthand what our pain points are and the direction that we want to go collectively. So I think they, they definitely need to have a seat at the table. Um, I think everyone at that table needs to understand the challenges and then work together to come up with those solutions. It's not, it, it, what um, I think the challenge is um, many times is it's this versus that or it can only be this, you know, it, it can't be these two things collectively or we can't come up with a, a, a new solution, um, sometimes people feel very protective of the areas they're in, and that's sometimes the challenge we have to get past. But I think if everyone's at the table with the right intention, um, government and industry and education can definitely play together to figure this thing out. We've heard uh, voices on our program um, who make the case that what's happening with technology in the next 25 years and what it does to the workforce, there are some unfortunate parallels with the history of freer trade and globalization, which they argue the deal was we're going to open up our borders so that the better jobs happen here and the worst jobs disappear, but we will retrain people. But at the federal level, there have been some wonderful things that have been done, but uh, there are critics who say we generally fell down on the job, didn't pay enough to retrain people. And you can see that pattern there's a future in which we repeat the pattern, and there's a future where we figure out from our past uh, experience. Question over here. These are great questions. Tell us your name. Oh, thank you. Uh, my name is Jessica DiCerbo. I am a working professional student at the Fisher Collar College of Business and a project manager at J.P. Morgan Chase. My, I would like to talk about what uh, about the training or the education for students, elementary, middle, and high school, specifically about low-income and underserved communities who are battling for resources. We have schools in here in Ohio who still don't have access to internet, where teachers have to pay out of pocket for their school supplies. So how do we, what efforts need, do we need to take to not only get to a place where we can train and build the skill sets for our students, but overcome this tremendous hurdle that currently plagues many of Ohio and I'm certain the nation's schools? Yeah, is this discussion that we're having, thank you, is this discussion we're having also really about the quality of education because it, sure. the, the presumption is it leads to fulfilled human beings and that often means a good job. Yes, I hate to be a remedial system and sometimes I am because people are coming out of uh, high school and still are skills deficient and I don't mean in high level skills, I'm talking about math and reading and so that is something that we have to see fixed. 
so yes, I'm very concerned about that. And I uh, am certainly vocal to our own local school systems and also, frankly, to the state because um, you know, school funding, some of our school funding comes at the state level as well. Um, it is something that we have to solve. I don't believe that we have solved it well. And I think that, um, I think that's all I'm gonna say about that. Because <laughs> that could be another hour. <laughs> is that something that uh, your work struggles with? Is uh, just the general level of the schools that yeah, would I, supply people? Yeah, I, I think just generally, you know, we're going to have better success finding talent if more people have access to quality education and quality learning. Um, one of the things that we're doing at Honda is supporting educational organizations um, and experts in the area of robotics um, that have the ability to generate grants and collaborate with um, educational institutions or, or local school systems that don't have those resources. So we're, we're, we're partnering with people that have been successful in it in a particular region, which may have funding uh, previously to get things going, but taking that successful model, selling it to local, state, federal government, so that with Honda's name behind it, um, we can hopefully uh, support some funding and some um, opportunities with uh, VEX Robotics and FIRST Robotics and, and um, IT pathways and things like that in school systems that don't have it that we draw from our, our talent from. So, Again, it's very important to have this collaborative nature and for industry to be engaged and understand that situation. Um, we're pulling from rural populations, we're pulling from urban po populations um, and, and suburban populations, and it's important that all of those people have opportunities um, to have the skills that are ready. So we're, we're out there um, doing as much as we can, uh, supporting and providing, uh, and trying to provide leadership around that. So great question, thank you very much. Sir, I recognize you from television. <laughs> Tell us your name. I'm Bill Schiffman. I'm a CPA and a financial advisor. I'm also the longtime host of In the Know on WOSU TV. <laughs> and as a game show host, I feel that I have the prerogative to ask you two questions. <laughs> <laughs> you may answer one or both. The first question is, do you feel that society has a responsibility for industries as a whole that are moribund and at the bottom of the McKinsey scale like the truckers? Trucking industry could be wiped out in 20 years due to artificial intelligence, self-driving vehicles, et cetera. So what do you feel society's responsibility is toward the quarter of a million or so truckers? The second question is, as learning moves further and further toward skill acquisitions through STEM, what, if any, do you feel the role of the humanities is in the future workforce? Oh, that's easy. So, first of all, it's always going to be surprising, right, which of the industries truly fail. Because just because you could automate doesn't necessarily that's mean right. that you that's do. Right. That's right. Sometimes it's just better or more efficient or we just safer to keep the humans involved. But what about, like, toll taker uh, is not a job of the future. Uh, and my heart goes out to anyone who, here who has a family member who does that. Uh, when we were reporting this a year ago, when we stopped at tolls, people told us they only had a few more months. Uh, but how would you react to uh, his first question? So I don't get a choice. I have to do the first one. <laughs> well, you could, you could choose yes. anything no, you no, like. No, no, no. So. Absolutely. I, I, well, pers personally, I feel that we, have, as a society, have a responsibility that we share for all of us. So, you know, do we have a responsibility uh, in the market to make sure truck drivers continue to have a truck driving job into the future. I'm not sure about that. I feel a responsibility to the truck driver to make sure that we're working. Right now, there is a high demand for truck drivers right now. And we train people. We help them get their CDLs because there is a demand right now. But 
you know, will there be a demand in five years for short-term truck drivers, short distance, I mean? Uh, maybe, maybe not, probably not, but I think we have a responsibility to make sure that we are continuously working to skill up those truck drivers for either what's coming in that industry that they would still want to be a part of or for other career pathways. And I do feel that we as a society do have that. Because here's the thing, <laughs> if we let other people not have jobs, continue not to have jobs or income, industry doesn't survive because then nobody has income to buy a Honda car, right? And, and the fact is, um, we, it's in, it, even if you don't want to buy the argument of social justice or civic responsibility, if you want to look at it from completely a market perspective, then people need to have jobs to make income to buy cons be consumers. And our, otherwise, this particular society we live in isn't, is going to collapse because we live in a capitalist market. Well, thank you. <laughs> but so, so from that perspective, yes. OK. By the way, um, and we'll continue answering that question, we have exactly the right number of people at microphones now for the time that's allotted. So if you're standing there, keep standing there, and we'll get to your question, hopefully. Um, do, would you want to answer either of those? Or one of the second one was about humanities, and does it matter? Can I take the first one? Yeah, you can take the first one. <laughs> well, if I would have known that, I would have answered I'll, I'll, I'll do the humanities one. Okay. We'll go back um, to you on humanities. Uh, so um, from an industry perspective, especially from Honda, I, I think it's very important um, that we support our local communities and offering opportunities. So we're going to continue to work with our suppliers, um, our dealer network, and um, make sure that the community understands what those in-demand jobs are, one. Two, again, continuing to work with our local educational institutions, not, not simply to have pathways in place, but to actively promote with them those opportunities to community members. And I, I think that's the approach that Honda is taking and will continue to take in the future. Humanities question? Well, I thought you wanted to take it. Well, we could share. <laughs> I, 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 I have a liberal arts undergraduate background, and so I'm biased in this. Um, but uh, it, it's a degree in critical thinking yes. and yes. writing and communicating. So all those things that I said are important for jobs are all taught in the humanities. And so um, I, do th I, I think those will continue to be important. Question, tell us your name. Hello, I'm Andre Roman. And uh, you kind of touched on this. But what is the cost of failure? Like, we can say that society will collapse if robots overtake humanity and take all the jobs and so on. And will that be exactly what happens? Or what things can we do to prevent the collapse of society as we know it? Wow. Wow. <laughs> so, um, you start. I, yeah. So, I um, Again, I, was in a, I attended a very interesting panel discussion that Lisa was on with Daryl West from the Brookings Institute. And he wrote a book, um, I'll say about what you were, what you were talking about. And um, essentially, one of the main, I think the, the, the main idea from the book is we're either going to move to dystopia or utopia depending on how we approach these things. So I don't have an answer to your question necessarily, but um, Daryl West would say that failure doesn't look very good at all. Um, and it essentially, if I remember right, would be a, pretty much a collapse of uh, the US society, um, maybe even globally. So um, he, his approach was uh, very um, interesting and dynamic. And I think it's, it's uh, one that we have to take a look at at least components of. So Some people are talking about universal basic income in which you have to you. Just yes. pay everybody. You're, yeah, there are concepts because like you, the, the, there's, you, Failure is not an option. Some people are talking about, uh, there's some thoughts at Harvard about this in which um, you encourage people to have stock ownership in technology companies. So you live off the dividends. You essentially own a piece of the robots. Interesting notion. And you talked about the uh, where you pay into educational 
um, like an educational like, fund, like an educational fund, fund which so is kind of an interesting concept. But can I just one real quick? We we aren't all. This is what I I know I said before, and you said don't say that because <laughs> you all weren't part of that conversation. But this is not just happening to us. We and we don't have agency. We have the ability to make decisions about what technology implementation is going to be good for us as a whole and what technology is fun to play with, but maybe overall is not necessarily the right way to go for a variety of reasons. And we all have that agency together. We are not just all sitting here and robots are going to walk in, right? We have to stop acting like technology is happening to us because people are creating the technology and we are the people who decide to use it or not, to implement it or not. So I don't think we're going to fail. Tell us your name. Hi, my name is Thor Shesso. I'm a PhD student here and geomorphologist. So I've got a brief comment and then a question. My comment is uh, you talked about languages uh, a little bit ago, and I was surprised that no one mentioned um, like computer languages. Mm, yeah. Mm. You know, when I talk to my peers and whatnot, we routinely ask each other when we're getting to know each other, like, what languages do you speak? And for me, it's Ruby, Python, R. <laughs> Uh, you know, but right. somebody else maybe is oriented more towards C sharp, C plus yeah. plus, right? So, yeah. right. just want to say that we do speak lots of languages. Um, <laughs> that's, that's that's excellent. Maybe a little yeah. bit Good different. Point. Yes. Um, my question is about inequality, which has been touched on a little bit. But um, the big one is, how do we distribute the wealth created by machines? But I think it's worth pointing out that our whole economic system is, is based upon how much we contribute as individuals to the economy, the hourly wage and whatnot. So as more and more of the work is done by machines, that means fewer and fewer hours worked by humans, which means that the wealth is then distributed more and more to fewer and fewer people. Um, so you know, if we are working towards a post-work society, how do we deal with this post-labor population? And, and how do we address you know, some of these inequality issues that it raises? The inequality stuff is absolutely front and center. But your scenario is possible. It's not the only scenario, uh, we should be aware, that it's possible all this technology really does create, ultimately after a period of intense disruption, more jobs for humans. It's not just that we're going to run out of work. That's, a scenario that I worry about at night, but it isn't the only possible outcome. Right. But the inequality question is a really crucial question, and some of it was the... Who wants to answer Yeah, I know. <laughs> I mean, universal basic income is one of the yeah, things that, that people think yeah, about. Yeah, and I, wow. I worry about that, though, because I believe work provides dignity to people. And I, I worry about this idea that those who have wealth want to just pay those who can't work a basic income and move on. And I also don't think, again, if we're a consumer society, that would really work for the long haul. So, I don't. I don't know. Yeah, I, I, that's. I, 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 don't, <laughs> I think. About I don't know it. that I'm informed enough, quite honestly, to, to answer that one well. Bill Gates said, in an interview, "Tax the robots." A robot tax, and a lot of people had an infarction. Uh, I got. Larry Summers, the former <laughs> Treasury Secretary, to comment on that. And he's very focused on inequality issues, Larry Summers. He just thought that was a horrible penalty on innovation. So there's that problem. But it's the general inequality issue that yeah, we're facing no, no, across right the now. society. Yeah, right. Mm -hmm. And, and yep. you know what? At a time of all this great partisan thinking and people so divided, you'd think that would be what we're all talking about and are on the same page about, because that's the... <laughs> one of the central issues. Yeah. I will say it is key for us to be successful going forward. I mean, from an in, again, from an industry standpoint, um, we can't, we're, we're, it's not sustainable to only pull from a certain population and have those that are skilled and, and able to work um, and given opportunities to prepare that way. It's, it's, not, it's not a sustainable model. All right, so we're gonna be disciplined on our answers because we're getting close to time, so. Uh, I'll try to be disciplined on my Yeah, tell us your name, though. <laughs> I want to hear your name. Um, okay, so my name's Carissa Roberts, and I study Hispanic linguistics or, and the Spanish department. And um, I want to talk a little bit or ask a little bit about the hiring end and equal opportunity, but I like, 
I grew up upper middle class, so I learned all about the importance of networking and having those connections, which is really helpful when I already have those connections, because that meant I, well, I interned for two years mm -hmm. as an energy engineer. <laughs> and I felt like I had no business being there, but I was successful because I committed to on-the-job training and things. So I'm wondering, like, how do you create eat those opportunities for people who aren't even thinking to walk in the door or in, you know, um, the, the jobs that generally Or who may not have yeah. the wherewithal to be able to do an internship because they need a big paying job. So great question. Um, I, again, from Honda's perspective, we um, partner with local um, industry and uh, in this case, the Columbus City School District uh, to provide resume writing um, and personal statement workshops. So we partner with The Ohio State University, uh, Columbus State Community College, and other industry partners to offer that to STEM students in the district. Um, in addition to that, um, we provide a mock interview um, that we hold here, I think, on, uh, here on campus, um, or at Columbus State, for those students, 40 or so students. And then those 40 students get summer internships in the um, area where they can develop those critical, for their critical skills. So I, again, um, it's identifying those opportunities, and my opinion, industry engaging, and it being a collaborative effort to offer that up. So that's just one example. And this is part of your work. Right, right. I mean, we're, we look at things like uh, mentorship, and we work with youth primarily 16 to 24, um, and we're looking at mentorship. I think that's very, very effective. Um, trying to, if people are in school, trying to look at the co-op internship yeah, route, right, yeah. where people, kids have an opportunity to work yep. while they're still finishing school. Yep. Um, you know, it, mentorship, though, to me, is one of the biggest things and, and something I personally believe in quite a bit, is turning around, and you should do that as well, and handing, putting a hand up to teach kids yeah. and help them to network, because the network is the net that catches their job. <laughs> and that's what I tell kids. And that's a, I just to add to that, we're, we're leveraging our business resource groups to do exactly what you're mm -hmm. talking about, which I think is a great way to uh, bring the organization into the community to do that. All right, last question from this side of the room. Your name? Yes, uh, L.J. Manning. I'm a uh, resident at Worthington area. I'm business software sales uh, most of my career. Um, very fundamental question. Um, it might seem so simple based on all the very uh, academic discussions that have been excellent tonight, but... You know, we, we know that statistically there's a shortage in workforce management, uh, apparently, or, or throughout the country and even here in Columbus. But we have a working poor population. We have a population, uh, minority population, Somali populations, African American populations, and, and not unusual in all, all the cities in our country. Mm -hmm. But what, from what I, my simple observation is, their challenge is that they're too, they don't have the means for the transportation. Yeah. And if we could uplift this segment of our our population, uh, I think it would be immense for our country and for our central Ohio, but how, how can that be done? Because it doesn't, it doesn't seem that we have made any progress locally amongst our, our, our political brethren. So uh, I just, that's my observation and question. Thank you. We're working, we work in that every day. Um, how do we get um, people from populations who haven't had access to the kinds of skills, education, need access to transportation, child care, support and benefits so that they can go to acquire those skills. I mean, that's what, I, that's what we're doing every day. And there are pockets of success, and the problem is how do we take those pockets of success and scale them up? And I think here in Columbus that we have a very collaborative, I mean, we are all very focused on it, and we all want to move that needle and stop talking about it. And I think, I think we will in the next five years but everybody's, people everywhere in Columbus now are talking yeah. about that very issue, which is different than maybe five years ago. Yeah, I agree with Lisa. I, I'm in many workforce development discussions, and it's at the top. It's in every discussion that we have, um, especially those that, that are um, working within the economic development groups because they just they feel like their hands are tied and they can't really do anything about it. Um, but I, I think the collaborative nature of what's forming, we're maybe not there yet, but it's identifying those, those best practices and figuring out how we can scale things up so um, that we can do it. It's an issue. And the, I mean, 
I've heard of boundary issues in terms of the travel, so it's yeah. something to work very on. Very interesting. You've been very patient. What's your name? I'm uh, Bodie Turner. You've placed a lot of emphasis on uh, worker training programs. What do you think the future holds for uh, small businesses that don't necessarily have those wide-scale training programs? Oh, excellent, excellent question, Bodie. Uh, I know Bodie, so I should be, I should be transparent <laughs> about that. You expected greatness and you were rewarded. I, and I was well rewarded. Um, and that is something also that we can't forget, is that um, we have lots of small businesses who also have needs, and we do a lot of work in that realm as well. Um, one of the things that, especially in smaller businesses, they need to understand that everybody who can work should and, uh, and can be accommodated, so people with disabilities, people who maybe have been previously incarcerated but have served their time and are ready and willing to work. And in our smaller businesses, I find um, that in some cases people are more willing, because they're smaller, to go to what perhaps people think of as a non-traditional workforce. Um, but uh, you know, there's also um, entrepreneurship as a potential business, and not the gig economy entrepreneurship, but entrepreneurship where you have a business idea and you actually end up employing other people you know, with wages and benefits. Um, and we uh, need to figure out how we remember that there is still that as a pathway um, to being self-sufficient. So I think that's, that's, a, great, that's a great point. Uh, so um, Honda is partnering with uh, smaller businesses um, that have you know, machining operations, equipment integration. Uh, and what we're doing is we're taking models that we've developed with our educational partners and then inviting them to participate. Uh, and then leveraging some of our resources to support them with executing that. So if it's a work-based learning program, taking that model, um, applying it to, the, to those small businesses, and then um, even leveraging some of our recruiting team to share some of our practices of um, how we're um, marketing, manufacturing to those, to those individuals. Because again, we, we need all the talent we can get. It's not just about Honda. Great question, thank you. And let me just say, the backbone of the economy here in the state of Ohio and in central Ohio is actually small business. They hire more people than Honda does. And uh, so small yeah. business is really the backbone of the economy, not necessarily our largest uh, companies. And sir. No, that's you, man. Um, uh, yeah, it's me. Oh, what's your um, name? Steven Bayou. I'm an integrated social studies major at Ohio State. Um, I was wondering about uh, education and teachers and whether or not they would be compensated moving forward in our current society, like whether or not they can actually make a living wage and not have to work multiple jobs or I, it, I'm already a server. I don't want to work a second job as a server when I'm teaching for high school. So, but there's this crucial thing about uh, the the costs of education and the talented workforce that we need to be teaching yes. these higher level skills that the tech laden workforce is going to require. It's it's a challenge. Um, I don't have a solution. But um, when we're talking to some of our uh, career tech educators, as an example, it's difficult for them to find the talent uh, of those that have the skills um, to deliver that training uh, when those same individuals can work at an industry, right? So it's a real issue. Um, I think, again, we need to continue to work together um, to figure out ways to make it so that education uh, can be delivered in a way that uh, where teachers, you know, can make a, a continue to make a living wage and, and um, bring the technology and the, and the learning that they need into the classroom so that they're not spending money out of their pocket to do so. But um, we we're- We talk about STEM as being something that we need to invest in and yeah. something that is one of the most important things that we have and you're both in STEM technologies yeah. and something that you need people coming through that. And I am, not in school to be a STEM teacher. I'm, I'm going to be a social studies teacher. Yeah. But I feel like that is the width and breadth Absolutely. that you add to yeah. a student's life. Yeah. And that makes them 
prepared to be a STEM person or yeah. or to, to live and be, to be a well-rounded, yeah, that, that, educated yeah, person. To be a, a, a more informed <laughs> and, and, and more well-rounded citizen of the world. Scott alluded quickly to the special economic challenge of the STEM teachers, which is if you're really good and you're a great physics teacher, you might be right. able to get a higher paid job you know, at a research lab. One of uh, my closest friends is an elementary teacher in the Worthington School System. And when you see what she does in her classroom with kids, um, they'll be prepared to work at Honda for sure because they are doing the neatest things and they don't even understand that they are doing the neatest things. So I think teaching is a profession that, uh, right, teachers should be paid what sports figures are paid <laughs> because we're relying on, on, on you to, to, even as in what you're gonna be teaching, those skills I talked about are gonna be taught in your classroom, right? Communication, critical thinking, collaboration, right. creativity, right? You'll be teaching all those, and those are extremely important. I, I, I'm sorry. I, no, no, no. So I, I, need I to think figure it's also important. I mean, in addition to you know the compensation piece, which is important, I think industry needs to engage teachers and offer opportunities for you to come in and see what we're see what we're doing, and we need to engage you um, in the classroom and support you with what you're doing in education, and that, that's not happening enough. I Do you think that industry needs to incentivize education or? education needs to incentivize industry. I, I think industry needs to bring resources to education and that may or may okay. not be funding, but I think yeah. we, we need that. Should it be funded by industry or should it be funded by, <laughs> should it be funded by education? Should it be funded governmentally? Yeah, that, that I, I don't know that I have an answer to that, but, but I think the collaboration and, and, and the intentionality of industry to work with education is 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 paramount. Would Honda uh, pay for that? Would Honda pay for would his Honda, education? Would Maybe Honda work, work with education and would <laughs> Honda like put more into local school systems? Not even just in Columbus, Honda but does do yeah, quite we, a well, bit in yeah, local no, school I mean, systems. We, we, they do. Yeah, we yeah. we we do do that, and and I think um, you know there's a lot in of in kind they um, activity to. happening, and and so um, yeah, I mean. Could, could Honda and others do more of that? Absolutely, I, and I, I think that's... And thank I think you very much for your multi-part question. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> Sorry, I'll walk away. So my bet for most robot-proof job after that journey, you could argue with me, we could have a nice form about that as well. In the end, I decided it would be entrepreneur, right? Because if you're an entrepreneur, you're fulfilling an unmet need, and you're responding to a change. To be an entrepreneur requires a lot of things, um, you know, the training, but also access to capital. So that's another issue. But entrepreneur is pretty darn robot proof. And so I profiled in a Popular Mechanics magazine, um, the most robot proof job was an entrepreneur who started a robot company. So <laughs> he's, he's going to do fine. Many kinds of capital, you think of capitalism, you think of our capitalist system. There's a different kind of capital. You participated in that tonight. Everyone at home is also participating by spending some time engaging these issues. It's called social capital. People come out from their living rooms and, and kitchens and chew on important issues to make the world a better place. Thanks for being a uh, generator of social capital. Thank you very much for the panel. Lisa Pat McDaniel, <laughs> Workforce Development Board of Central Ohio. It's Scott McLemore at Honda. And thank you. David, we have one more job for you. No, you want me to come up? Oh. Am I tied in here? I might we have be. A, here we go. I'll, yeah. I'll come to you. How's okay, it? okay. This is for the Marketplace Swag Bag Socks Marketplace Mug. Socks. There's a mug in there, a highly, sandwich box. Is that right? We have one? And uh, a portable speaker. So there you go. Wow. Oh, a portable nice. speaker. Wow, we got better swag than <laughs> I imagined. <laughs> I'm just pulling out one, right? <laughs> yeah, just read the number. All right. The winner is 5995589. You hear? You have to be present to win. Uh, Take a look. No? No. 5995589. Twice. All right. All right. We'll try it again. Try again. All right. Let's try this one. Five nine nine five four four nine. 
There we go. All right. All right. Yeah? All right. Congratulations. Congratulations. Uh, thank you all for joining us. This was a terrific dialogue. Our best yet. We have another one coming up November 13th. It's a Tuesday night. I believe we're going to talk about politics, but watch your emails uh, from WOSU and from the Glenn College of Public Affairs. And I cannot thank David Brancaccio enough. Yeah. Oh, thank you. Thank you. You were amazing. Thank you. The man got a phone call yesterday and said, how would you like to go to Columbus, Ohio tomorrow morning? And he's here and he did a wonderful job. So we cannot what? thank him enough. Yeah. Thank you all for coming. I guess because...